Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the Crystal non Global Water Program. So as a PUC, uh, I think most of you know, we're a water, waste, water, and, and power provider. By uh, drinking water about 2.6 million people every day, provide wastewater services for the city and county in San Francisco. And we also provide 100% uh, greenhouse gas-free uh, energy for city services. So we're looking to bring that power into people's homes and businesses. That'll be happening soon, but right now we use that power to power our muni lights, our traffic signals, uh, city buildings. So as part of our, our WISA program, which is a, a huge $4.8 billion program to seismically upgrade our water system, one of the goals of that program that was written into uh, what was adopted by the Board of Supervisors was water supply diversification. And so with that, that order, uh, really pushed our agency to tackle water supply diversification. And we've done that in four main ways. We have a very strong conservation program. There's a folks from our conservation team here. Uh, San Francisco's lowest per capita water use uh, in the entire state. It's, gosh, it was, was at 47 before the drought, but I think maybe 42 or 43 uh, gallons per capita per person. Uh, we also have a groundwater program that's going on right now. We have a project where we're building new groundwater wells inside the city and county of San Francisco, so we're using some local water sources that will blend with our regional supply for Hetch Hetchy. Uh, we have a recycled water program. Uh, we're building a new plant on the west side to provide recycled water to all of Golden Gate Park. So all of Golden Gate Park will be irrigated by recycled water. Uh, we have some other smaller projects uh, that um, irrigate some other golf courses within the city. What I want to talk about today is a program I manage, and that's the, the on-site water system. So this is collection and treatment of alternate water sources for non-potable applications at a given site or within a district. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that today. So with that program, we really have to rethink and reimagine how water is used, not only within a building, but within a district. You know, traditionally, water suppliers, we looked at buildings, we looked at districts, as simply as water demands. How much do, is this building going to put on our water demand? Also looked at it as what is the demand then on our sewers? So what we we're saying here is we want to flip that, that thinking a little bit. You know, we, we started looking at this and we saw that in multifamily buildings, and remember Levi pointed out what, what homes, homes have a little bit different use than multifamily buildings. Because multifamily buildings don't have big irrigated areas, especially in San Francisco. So the multifamily home, we saw that 50% of the water use is not potable. So that's 50% of the water use that does not need to be supplied with drinking water. In a commercial office building in San Francisco, it jumps about 95%. Really the only uses that you need to be potable in an office building are you know, out of your sinks for washing your hands, if you have some showers, and you have some drinking fountains and cooking areas. The cooling, the irrigation, all of the toilet flushing, that can be supplied with, with non-potable uh, recycled water. So we also saw that buildings actually supply these water sources on site that can meet those non-potable demands. So we saw that you know if you collected rainwater from your roofs, you can collect that rainwater, treat it, and you can flush your toilets with it or put it in your cooling towers, use it for irrigation. We also saw storm water, and that's that's collected at or <coughs> below grade. So there's a difference between rainwater and storm water. The reason being is the type of contaminants picked up by rainwater are going to be much different than the type of contaminants picked up by stormwater, so they have to be treated differently. Uh, you may get from your roof pigeon droppings and, and things of that nature. From your, from your streets and your sidewalks, you're collecting coppers and volatile organic compounds and gases, so you have to treat it a little bit differently. Uh, we also have a lot of foundation drainage um, in San Francisco. In uh, areas where there were historic creeks and high groundwater levels that we paved over, paved over hundreds of years ago, when we would build big buildings, especially buildings that had garages, we'd hit these groundwater plumes, basically. And so there's two ways you could sort of handle that. You can either build a wall around your project and just have the groundwater sort of hit that wall and then it flows beneath it or flows around it. I always think that in the end, water's going to win so that, you know, who knows what those, what those uh, structures are going to be able to hold, you know, in another 100 years. The other way is to bring that water inside your building and then pump it into the city sewer system. So there are some basements in, in high-rises I've been to in San Francisco where buildings are discharging 30,000 gallons per day to the sewer, 40,000, 100,000 gallons of fairly clean water into the sewer to maintain the structural integrity of their building. That's a good water source to use. Uh, gray water. Gray water has become really popular within uh, California. Uh, I don't know if folks are familiar with the plumbing code in here. Are there plumbers in here? 
Some? Okay. So we even have chapters now, chapter 16 and 16A within the California Plumbing Code that lay out how you build a structure, how, all the plumbing requirements, piping requirements. So this has become very popular within uh, California. You use gray water, which is water from clothes washers, bathtubs, showers, and sinks, for reuse, whether it's flush toilets or irrigation or cooling tower. And then finally, uh, black water. There are buildings that are collecting all of their wastewater, treating it on site, and sending it back up for toilet flushing or into their cooling towers. So we started looking at this, and we were also building a new building. Um, it opened in June 2012, so I was assigned to be the project manager for the water systems within the building. And we wanted to do something very aggressive um, and progressive at our building. We wanted to sort of, you know, if you're going to talk the talk and tell people to conserve water and that recycled water is great, then we also have to do it at our building. So we, we put in two separate non potable water systems. We have a rainwater harvesting cistern. So we capture rainwater from our roof. And we have a child daycare center at our building, so employees can bring their, their, their young kids to work and they're watched there. Well, the outside playground area of that, of that child daycare center is this permeable, bouncy material. Um, it's great because if the kids fall, they don't break their arms. It's not hard concrete, but it's also permeable. So the rainwater hits it and soaks through it. So we capture all that rainwater and we use it for irrigation around the building. And then we also have a, a, what's called a wetland treatment system. Um, and we have wetlands that surround our building out on the sidewalk and even in the building lobby that collect all of the building's wastewater, about 5,000 gallons a day. We treat it and we send it back upstairs for toilet flushing purposes. We save about a million and a half gallons per year of water by doing that. So I'll walk you through the wetland system really quickly. This is what it looks like when you're walking down the street. You see, this is, it looks just like normal plantings, but this is 5,000 gallons per day of wastewater treatment in the densest neighborhood of the second densest city in the country. So it, it's safe and there's no public health um, negative impacts. This is basically how it works for the operators that are out there. This wet, the wetland fills up from the bottom and goes up and down, up and down. It's a small one horsepower pump that's pushing the water up and down. We place microorganisms within these wetlands. So when the water is pumped up, the microorganisms feed on, on the organics in the water, treating the wastewater. And while water drops, there's a rush of oxygen, uh, so much so that we don't need any mechanical aeration or additional um, processes there. So that's the first wetland. The wetland then flows uh, to a second set of wetlands. Um, this is, again, right outside in the, in the right of way. Um, more of the same treatment there. Microorganisms in those, are in those wetlands. Then the water moves inside to our building lobby, about 20 feet from a cafe where hundreds of people eat every day. Um, again, no, no odor concerns. And then finally downstairs, the disinfection. So the disinfection starts with a 100 micron screen filter. Then we go to a 5 micron cartridge filter, this, this big bubble filter right here. Uh, up through UV disinfection. And then we drop a little bit, about 0.5 parts per million uh, chlorine into the water before it's into the recycled water tank. Um, so that, that's our system. Um, and these are the water quality requirements that we have to hit. So it's basically, if you know Title 22, it's very similar to Title 22. And there may be some Title 22 experts in the room that are seeing some slight differences, um, but it's really pretty similar. And we've never failed uh, in the three years of operating it to meet any of these water quality standards. Uh, we've never had to report out that we haven't hit one of these standards. We have had maintenance times where we've had to take the system offline to fix a pump or you know, change out a UV light bulb. Uh, we have our maintenance team, our gardening crew come once a month, so we turn the system off. We've never had to turn it off because of a regulatory uh, failure. So when we were doing this project, I mean, we're a water and wastewater utility. Um, we have tons of operators that work in our building. We, you know, we have a lot of engineers, project managers. But we didn't want to be the only building in San Francisco that could do this. We wanted for every building that wanted to do this to be able to. So we knew we needed to set up a regulatory framework for that. But there were a lot of questions, you know, who should set these water quality standards? Should it be the state? Should it be the local? Uh, who issues the permits and provides, you know, operational oversight? We don't want to just give people the opportunity to install these systems and then just have them just walk away. Um, I think as all of you know, you can't put in a black water system or any sort of water treatment system and just plug it in and never do any operations and maintenance on it. That, that, something at some point will happen where you need to, uh, to um, fix it. So we want to make sure that we had oversight on that. Um, what are going to be the monitoring and reporting requirements that should be implemented? 
if you run, run a recycled water plant, you know, municipal one, you have to send reports out to, to the state. What were we going to do? Were we going to send them to the state? Were we going to have people send them to us? So those are all questions we had. And so what we came up with was we wanted to do it at the local. Uh, we wanted to do everything locally, so everything would be through city and county of San Francisco um, agencies. So in 2011, we began talks what we call the city family agencies. That was the PUC, which again was a water, wastewater provider. Um, we, we formed a team with the San Francisco Department of Public Health and the San Francisco Department of Building Inspections. We thought there were sort of three key components to this program. Can you build it properly? Can you operate it properly? And is the water supplier on board with it to make sure there weren't any cross connections with our supply and, and, and things of that nature? So we started in 2011 talking, and in 2012, uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, introduced an ordinance and it was adopted and signed into law by the mayor, allowing for the voluntary installation of an on site water reuse system in any new commercial building that wanted to do it. It was completely voluntary. So in 2013, we started telling designers and developers about the program just so they knew about it. And what the designers and developers were telling us is that's great to do on the single building, but really uh, in terms of economies of scale and where we see bigger um, reductions in potable water use is if multiple buildings could have one system that feeds three or four of them. Um, that's where you can see a much better ROI in terms of the systems and the, and the plumbing costs that, that you have to put in. So we again initiated talks with city family agencies to see if we could do this. Um, could, you know, a private building, private building A, sell recycled water to private building C. Would that be okay? Right? Did they, does that make them a public uh, water utility? Does it, does it trigger a, a whole new set of regulatory uh, requirements for these buildings? And what we found out was that it, it didn't. And so we amended the ordinance, and so now in San Francisco, buildings can sell, trade, whatever they want to do, non-potable water back and forth to each other. All we need to do is see the legal agreement between those parties. The city of San Francisco doesn't get involved in setting those requirements, so we don't say that building A has to sell to building B for $10 a gallon. That's between those parties. We just need to, need to see that there's an agreement in place so those parties both agree to be within that, that uh, agreement. So since um, we set this up, we knew that it had to take there was multiple public agencies that had to be involved. So we created this, this team and it became a, a streamlined permitting process. Um, so this, the program starts off with the PUC, so I'll be contacted by a, a project and we'll talk about what supplies they want to want to use and what demands they're going to meet with those supplies. So someone may call me and say, I want to use rainwater harvesting to fill my cooling tower. I say, okay, great. So we, you know, we start talking to them, we provide technical support um, and we talk to them about the financial incentives that we have. DPH gets involved when the project, before they can even construct the, the, their project, they need to complete what's called an engineering report. Uh, there may be some of you who have completed engineering reports for municipal sized recycled water plants, the same thing. Um, they need to provide a, a non political engineering report that says what the water quality source is, what's the quality of that, that water quality source, what are they going to use to treat it. Will the, the treatment train they've set up meet the required water quality standards that, that the DPH has set up? What's the O&M manual? How often are they going to change their filters? All of those engineering questions have to be answered within this engineering report. Um, then the DPH approves that engineering report. SFDBI, is our department of inspections, it, uh, inspects the actual construction of the system. And then if it's a district scale project, DPW may need to issue what's called an encroachment permit. If you wanted to run a private pipe in the street from one building across the street to another building, that would take an encroachment permit from the Department of Public Works. Um, so they sometimes get involved. So again, this is just sort of a different way of looking at it. You, you put in your application to PUC, you do your non plumbing water engineering report. That's when you receive your plumbing permit after that approval. And then all the construction, and then you find there issues your, your, your permits, your starter permits from DPA. So again, three steps, design, construction, and operation. And this third step, this operation requires ongoing monitoring and reporting to the San Francisco Department of Public Health. If you don't complete that, that monitoring or you, you're not hitting the water quality requirements from SDPH, they can shut your system down, they can shut your building down, if you're creating a public health nuisance, um, they can find you. We have not had any project that's, that's gotten to that point. Um, 
all the folks have complied you know, with the requirements. They want to run these systems in a well-mannered way because they want to have the portable offsets. You don't want to spend you know, $400,000 on a system and then not operate it. So the PUC, again, we provide technical uh, and financial assistance. Um, I'll get into more of the financial assistance later, but we do have grant programs available um, up to $500,000 for, for projects that want to implement these types of systems. So since um, you know, it, it came into law in 2012, we've had 34 projects voluntarily um, install these types of systems, all different types of systems. So, um, we have a black water system. We're the only black water reuse system in San Francisco. We, we have a couple more coming soon, but they haven't applied yet. Um, but tons of gray water systems, rainwater systems, foundation drainage, lots of different systems being used for lots of different end uses. Um, here's their location throughout the city. As you can tell, they're all on the east side of San Francisco because that's where all of the new construction, big new construction projects are happening. Um, this is, by the way, not counting the hundreds, if not thousands, of people who have gotten rebated uh, rain barrels or cisterns for their residents. Those are, I mean, we have you know thousands of those throughout the city. These are big commercial projects that are installing really big, robust systems. So these 34 projects alone save 24 million gallons of drinking water per year. Um, in the recycled water world, that's not necessarily a large amount. You know, there are plants down in Southern California that are saving 74 million gallons per day. There are plants that are looking at 35 million gallons per day. This is per year, but we see it's just another um, technique for reducing water use. Uh, I really truly believe to meet the, the big water challenges California has, it's not just going to be a one solution. It's not just going to be just desal or just recycled water. You're going to have to implement all these things. Conservation, recycled water, um, groundwater management, sustainable groundwater management. It's going to take all these things. So we think this is just one of those pieces. Saving 24 million gallons of water at 34 buildings is, is pretty good. And, and every, it's cheesy, but I really think like every drop helps. And so this is just another method for, for doing that. So just a couple examples. Uh, this is the St. Anthony's building. It is the only 365-day-a-year uh, uh, food kitchen in San Francisco. Um, it's the only one. So it's 365 days a year, free food for any folks in San Francisco. And then up above is very low income housing and temporary housing for folks. If this new building, which is a, a nonprofit that uses every dollar towards good, can install an on-site water reuse system, in my opinion, any building can. Um, cost to me is not a good excuse because if they pulled it off and wanted to do it voluntarily, then, then other folks can as well. Uh, the Exploratorium, uh, some of you may have taken your kids there, it's a really great museum in Sarasco. They use rainwater for toilet flushing and they actually pay, pull up bay water and send it through their cooling system. Um, they have an MPDS permit from uh, the Regional Water Quality Control Board and they offset a ton of water use. It's three or four million gallons a year by, the, by those two alternate water sources. Uh, the new Sarasco Public Safety Building. So this is the new headquarters of the police and fire departments in San Francisco. And they collect gray water, rainwater, uh, condensate drainage for toilet flushing, cooling tower maintenance, and irrigation. They were into the water, uh, the water reductions. They wanted to be green, but the main reason they actually did on-site was because they need to keep their, their computer systems running, which have a huge cooling demand, even during a, a huge earthquake and emergency. They've got to stay online and, and running. So they collect gray water, and they always keep three days' worth of gray water. They're ready to go. So in case our water system goes down, the municipal water system goes down in, in a large uh, earthquake, They'll have all the water on site to keep their emergency systems going and ready so they can respond. If their computers go down, we've got huge issues with San Francisco. So part of, not only was water, uh, water conservation one of their goals, but resiliency was one of their goals. And we're seeing a lot of other folks talk about how on-site sources provide a, another, another uh, step within resiliency. Uh, the Trans Bay Transit Center is under construction right now. This is supposed to be called the Grand Central Station of the West Coast. Um, there's going to be high-speed trains going there, buses, bars, all these various various um, transportation systems. And this up here is going to be a gray water wetland. So gray water will come from all the bathrooms through this treatment system up on the roof and then go into the, the toilets for toilet flushing. Is that a black water system? Uh, gray water. Oh, okay. Uh, 101 Fremont, this is going to be a 70-story uh, high-rise. It's currently under construction. 
Um, they are capturing gray water from all of the, the fixtures in the building and using flush toilets. So that will have about a two million gallon per year offset. It's a big project. And then, so UN Plaza, um, this was an interesting project. So UN Plaza is actually a city project. It's not a, um, it's not a private project. And I got a call from uh, a guy at DPW and said, you know, if you go underneath the street here on Market Street, there's basically just a huge river that you can see it flowing and it fills up this big box and then you can see a pump, two pumps turn on and it drains it to the, to the sewer system. And it's non-stop, 24 hours a day. So I said, all right, let's go climb underneath Market Street and go take a look. Uh, it wasn't one of my favorite things to do, but we did find, sure enough, this big box that someone at some point in the city, when we came to find the drawings for it, had constructed. And they do it, obviously, to maintain the structural integrity of this plaza, because if not, this old creek would, would surface somehow. And it fills up and then is pumped to the sewer. So we also saw that there was an old pipe that had been disconnected. There was a pump and an old pipe that ran all the way out to right here on Market Street and stopped at Market Street at, at this old pump here. So it used to be that San Francisco, I don't know, at some point, pumped it up, this water, over to the street, and then there was a dispersal station here that I don't know who came and picked it up. Someone did, at some point. I'm mean, still looking for photos. Um, so we, uh, we love this. We thought we could use all that infrastructure. The pipe's still in good shape, everything. So we are rehabbing this station right now. Um, we've got $2.5 million to do it. And so hopefully in the next year or two, you'll drive up and there'll be a truck dispersal station of treated water there. It won't be for private residents to use, but our biggest street cleaning demand in, in the entire city, this is the Tenderloin area. We, we run three trucks through there every day, three shifts, cleaning the Tenderloin's uh, streets and sidewalks. Uh, they fill up currently, they do one pickup at our recycled water plant, but the other pickups are out at fire hydrants throughout the city, which are not filled with recycled water. This is a water source right there in the neighborhood that they can swing down, pick it up, and use it to clean the streets. Um, put, we think it'll offset about 15 to 20,000 gallons of water use per day. And so we're really excited about this station, sort of a no-brainer uh, with the infrastructure already in place there. Um, here's another one. So uh, BART obviously runs through Saren Scoville. BART is deep down in the groundwater table. So to maintain the structural integrity of BART at the BART Powell Street Station, they dump about 100,000 gallons of foundation drainage per day into the sewer system. About 300 feet away from where they discharge the sewer system is the entry point into a district steam loop in Sarasco. It's called NRG. NRG is a steam loop provider. That steam loop provider uh, uses about 300,000 gallons per day of portable water. So all you have to do is run a pipe three or 400 feet, put that 100,000 gallons of water into the steam loop, treat it a little bit, and then it'll be used to produce steam that will then feed at something like 50 or 60 buildings in downtown Sarasco. Again, sort of a no-brainer, a no but we just didn't think about managing water like that, you know, many years ago when these systems were built. Um, so sort of an update here. July 1 of 2015, the, the ordinance was amended, and it was amended to mandate on the site water reuse. So currently, it was previously voluntary. It's now mandatory. All new buildings beginning November 1, 2015, that are over 250,000 square feet, and that's quite a few in San Francisco. Almost every big new building is over 20,000 square feet. If you're over this size, you have to reuse water on site for toilet flushing and irrigation. It starts in our recycled water zone, which I'll show you in a little bit, and it expands to all citywide projects beginning November 1, 2016. That's, this isn't just public projects, this is private development. Any development, a university, anyone who builds a project over 20,000 square feet. So it starts in these gray areas. So it's already in, it's already applies to these gray areas, uh, starting November 1, 2015. And we have quite a few, as again, if you remember the map where I showed you what projects have already been built, most of our big buildings in San Francisco is happening right here. So it's, a, it's hitting a lot of these projects. November 1, 2016, any project in this entire, in the entire city will have to do on-site water reuse. They're over 250,000 square feet. So again, we have grants. So the way that we give out grants is if your project is able to offset 250 or is able to receive $250,000 of grant money, it offsets at least a million gallons of potable water use per year for 10 years. If your project can offset 3 million gallons of potable water use per, per year, then you're eligible for $500,000 grant. These grants are not 
available for projects that have to comply with the mandatory requirements. If you have to install it, we're not going to give you money to install it. The city county center school doesn't give money for people to comply with mandatory ordinances. So these are only the folks that are voluntarily doing it. We had 34 projects voluntarily do it in three years. So we feel that there's still going to be projects that continue to come forward and voluntarily do it. Uh, there's a couple that I know of that are supposed to be sending me their, their application soon. But San Francisco isn't the only place where on-site water reuse is happening. It's, it's happening all over the world. Uh, we're certainly not the only ones, and we weren't the first ones, by the way. New York has had projects doing on-site water reuse since, I think, 2003. Um, and Australia has tons of them. They had no option. Australia's droughts make our droughts you know, pale in comparison until recently. Um, so they've been doing it for a while. And so we saw this, and we, we knew that cities wanted to talk about it, and they wanted to implement these programs in, the, in their own cities. So a lot of different cities and municipalities and even uh, think tanks and the EPA flew out to San Francisco in May of 2014 to discuss uh, how they could set up their own programs to permit these systems. Because that's always that's a big issue. No one knows how to permit them. And you know, the key takeaway from that meeting were that really local management programs are needed. The states are really great at I mean, I'm sure that people are going to be great as a, maybe not the right term, but the states are able to regulate large-scale municipal plants, right? Um, and they do a, you know, a pretty good job. Would the state want to get 3,000 applications for rainwater harvesting systems every year? I, I don't know that they have the, the resources right now to handle that. It's even tough on the local uh, saying. But we, from talking to everybody at that meeting, including state departments, the local management programs seem to be needed. Um, and endorsing on-site systems through a policy or a program or even a general plan obviously can bolster their acceptability. Uh, incentives certainly help. And then obviously, again, I can't step away from how important it is to, to monitor the ongoing water quality of these systems. We can't just let people put in a system and, and walk away from it. That's where there can be serious concerns. They wouldn't do that on the municipal scale. You know, Levi's crew wouldn't walk away from from you know managing the recycled water system there and just you know to have at it people. So we can't let people do that on the on-site systems either. Um, we created a blueprint from that meeting. It was a, again a collaborative effort of all the attendees, and this blueprint lays out a step-by-step -step guide for local uh, utilities, local entities that want to set up their own on-site water reuse system program. So to, you know it talks about the ten steps. You know get a team. Uh, select the type of alternate water sources you want to be allowed to use. Some people don't want flat water to be recycled on site as soon as they're in They're not ready for it. So that you don't, you know, you don't have to. Pick which ones you want. Pick which end uses you want. Some people don't want rainwater going in cooling towers. They have concern about it. So figure out what, what you want. And then go through these steps. Water quality standards, building practices. This, this is how you do it. Um, and this came from a lot of input from a lot of different people who both have programs already and, and ones that don't, but thought these were good ideas. The next thing we're working on is a, a public health collaborative. And so this public health collaborative is going to come up with water quality standards for on-site water reuse in these locations. I, I, what we've heard from a lot of people is, yeah, in San Francisco they have their one set of water quality standards, but then I try to put a system in Portland and they're different, and in Washington they're different, and certainly in Canada they're different. And so we got together this team uh, of folks. There's an expert panel, and then there's a stakeholder panel. So there's two panels that are reviewing the work here. And hopefully the hope is that by April they'll come to consensus on, on the water quality requirements and monitoring requirements for all the on-site water sources and, and end uses. Um, so again, water quality parameters, monitoring parameters, guidance, and we'll have a final report that will be available to the public. Uh, the thought being is if we could all sort of get on board with the same water quality standard, It'll, it'll promote designers and vendors to build these systems uh, that can then be sold in all these different areas. So, so in San Francisco, what's, what's sort of next for the on-site, you know, reuse system world? Um, we have our first portable pilot rainwater project. So this is an office building. I know it doesn't look much like an office, but <laughs> it was a, it's a sustainability team. There's five of them in there, and they're, they're engineers. And again, they sort of wanted to walk the walk and talk the talk. So. They came forward to the city and said, we want to be as off the grid as possible. So all of their energy comes from solar. Um, they are completely off the sewer grid. They're not connected to our sewer. So they have a composting toilet, so that's where their waste goes. And their gray water goes out to this irrigated area here. So that takes care of their sewer, so they're not connected to our sewer. They get their, their potable water from rainwater that they collect from their roofs. 
uh, in a normal Sarasco rain year, which hasn't happened in a while, in a normal 22 inch Sarasco rain year, they'll have, the supply will be able to, to completely cover all of their demand. In fact, it'll cover 150% of their demand. They are still connected to the municipal potable water system because during drought years, they don't have enough water to cover their demand. They have to be able to get water from their sinks and things of that nature. So they are still connected to the municipal potable water supply, uh, but again, off the sewer grid. So this doesn't mean we're going to start permitting potable rainwater projects left and right. This is simply a pilot. Um, they agreed to, to let us you know, do a, a host of water quality testing and reporting and monitoring on them. They're obviously pay, they're paying for all of that. Um, so we're really excited to get the data from that and see is this something that would be viable. Um, but again, we're not running out and permitting anybody else you know, other than this one.